Well, uh, good morning. Uh, the, the mic's on. Okay. Uh, I originally did a draft of this, which turned out to be three times as long uh, as I have time for. And, of course, a lot has happened. So I cut it ruthlessly. But when I get back to Boston, I intend to take the, the full version, uh, revised it a little, and put it on my website. On my website, uh, without giving the full URL, if you just do a Google search on my name and AIDS, you'll find it pretty soon. Okay, so history of the controversy. Um, AIDS began in 1981 when a young man, an active homosexual, developed severe lung disease. Four more like him were found. Then a couple of dozen active homosexuals were found with Kaposi's sarcoma. Public health officials assumed that these few cases must have a connection, and they strained mightily to find one. Uh, in fact, uh, all of their speculations on the nature of PCP and, ca and Kaposi's sarcoma were wrong, and not only do they have no connection, but they are almost opposite in, in many respects. Uh, from their speculation, AIDS emerged, and in my talk, whenever AIDS appears, it's always in quotation marks. Uh, a pro protean construct rather than a coherent disease entity, a powerful and ever-evolving myth. Dubious tests and bizarre speculations were accepted uncritically until 1983, when a few voices of dissent were heard. In a few years, there would be hundreds and then thousands of us. An early AIDS critic was Joseph Sonneman, a New York physician with a practice mostly of gay men. Sonneman put fo forward a multifactorial model. AIDS was caused by multiple infections with known viruses together with immune suppressing effects of semen. Sonneman's multifactorial model disregarded drugs, antibiotics, and psychological factors. He poo-pooed the effects of poppers and other recreational drugs. When I told him that some of his AIDS patients with pneumonia continued to be chain smokers, he responded, somewhere between pity and contempt. If you knew that someone had only a few months to live, would you really deny them something that gave them pleasure? Sondermann has since recanted and has prescribed antivirals to his patients. On my own take here, AIDS is not a coherent disease entity, but a phony construct. In reality, different people are getting sick in different ways and for different reasons. In 1983, I began collaborating with Hank Wilson in San Francisco to warn gay men about the dangers of using poppers or the nitride inhalants. We wrote articles for the gay press and published a pamphlet, Poppers and AIDS. In 1984, a New York psychiatrist, Casper Schmidt, wrote an article, The Group Fantasy Origins of AIDS, which was published in the Journal of Psychohistory. Schmidt argued that AIDS could not be an infectious disease spread by germs because it followed cultural fault lines. Instead, according to Schmidt, AIDS is an example of epidemic hysteria. Schmidt's paper strongly demonstrates that in the decade preceding the first cases, Psychological warfare had been waged against gay men by religious fundamentalists who told them they ought to die. In February 1985, my first major AIDS article, CDC's Tables Obscure AIDS Drugs Connection, was published in the Philadelphia Gay News. Also in 1985, two AIDS articles of mine were published in the New York Native, which in the next 11 years would publish over 50 of my articles. The Native was then the foremost gay publication in the world, sold on newsstands all over the world. Finally, in 1985, Ben Gardiner in San Francisco started the AIDS Information Bulletin Board, which carried information on all sides of the controversy. 
The AIDS Info BBS evolved into a website, and it is still running. Uh, in January 1986, Nathaniel S. Lehrman's article, A Natural Epidemic, was published in the New Amsterdam News. Lehrman argued that HIV flunked Koch's postulates and that toxicological causes for AIDS should be investigated. Finally, in 1986, a small book, Death Rush, Poppers, and AIDS, by Hank Wilson and myself. We used Koch's postulates and Occam's razor to argue against a viral etiology and put forward a multifactorial model that emphasized toxins. 1987 was a momentous year. Peter Duisberg's article, Retroviruses as Carcinogens and Pathogens, Expectations and Reality, was published in Cancer Research, stating that retroviruses did not cause cancer or any other illness. In June, I interviewed Duisburg, and the controversy burst into the public arena. A month later, Celia Farber wrote her first AIDS article, also an interview with Duisburg, uh, for SPIN. My first articles on AZT were published in the Native, including AZT on Trial, which demonstrated that the Phase II AZ tri AZT trials were fraudulent. Gary Knoll began having AIDS critics like Duisburg and me on his radio show, WBAI, in New York City. On September 1987, AIDS, the Unheard Voices, the first of many AIDS critical documentaries produced by Joan Shenton and her company Meditel, was broadcast over Channel 4 television in the United Kingdom. It won a Royal Television Society uh, Journalism Award, equivalent to the Pulitzer Prize. In 1988, the AIDS establishment confronted Duisburg in a forum in Washington, D.C. Confronted by Anthony Fauci, Robert Gallo, and a truculent William Hazeltine, Duisburg was expected to recant, but he stood his ground and was supported by Harry Rubin, one of the pioneers of retrovirology. Early in 1988, Anthony Liversidge conducted a telephone interview with Robert Gallo, America's premier AIDS expert. Gallo ranted, raved, raved and swore, but failed to rebut Duisburg's criticisms of the HIV-AIDS hypothesis. Within a few years, Gallo would be found guilty of scientific misconduct, and two of his closest associates would be convicted of felonies. Later in 1988, Duisburg had a brief article, AZT is not the cause of AIDS, published in Science. Several non-orthodox books were published in 1988, the most important being John Rappaport's hard-hitting AIDS Incorporated, Scandal of the Century. The second volume of Michael Callan's Surviving and Thriving with AIDS appeared. And on 16 December 1988, the first AIDS Distant Conference organized by mathematics professor Frank Buanucas, was held in New York City at the Bronx Community College. In 1989, in addition to many AIDS dissident articles, several books were published, most notably John, Jad Adams' AIDS, The HIV Myth, Rosalind C. and Rosalind, I'm sorry, Richard C. and Rosalind J. Kirimuda's AIDS Africa and Racism. In Los Angeles in February 1989, Lawrence Badgley sponsored an alternative health symposium at which a number of AIDS dissidents spoke. <laughs> in 1990, the entire 115-page issue of a German magazine, Raum und Zeit, uh, under the title, I'll, I think this is English, uh, AIDS, the disease that doesn't even exist, was devoted to German, Swiss, and American AIDS critics who attacked the AIDS orthodoxies with intelligence and militancy. An important article by Peter Duisberg and Brian Ellison, Is the AIDS Virus a Science Fiction?, appeared in the summer issue of the conservative magazine Policy Review. Among the many critical AIDS books published in 1990 were Michael Callan's Surviving AIDS and my own Poison by Prescription, the AZT Story. 
On, in June 1990, Meditel's second major AIDS documentary, The AIDS Catch, aired over Channel 4 television. Narrator Michael Verney Elliott superbly enunciated such points as, AIDS was not behaving like an infectious disease. In Berlin, Kavi Schneider and Peter Schmidt began showing the Meditel documentaries and their own AIDS distant programs over the Ofen and Canal television. In May 1992, a major conference, AIDS, a different view took place in Amsterdam. Defenders of AIDS orthodoxy barged in at the last minute and things became a bit ugly, but we AIDS critics got our ideas across. Just before the conference, the Sunday Times, under a banner headline, published a two and a half page article by Neville Hodgkinson, experts mount startling challenge to AIDS orthodoxy. After a long battle with the Food and Drug Administration, I finally obtained documents under the Freedom of Information Act, which documented in stark detail the cheating that took place in the phase two AZT trials. Meditel's third AIDS documentary, AZT Cause for Concern, aired over Channel 4 television, causing thousands of AIDS patients to flush capsules down the toilet. Shares of Boros Welcome, the manufacturer of AZT, plunged, and the Welcome Foundation divested itself of Welcome stocks. Welcome retaliated, not by answering any of our arguments and not by suing for libel, but by surreptitiously attacking our reputations and livelihoods. AIDS critics from all over the world flew to Berlin for the June 1993 International AIDS Conference. Many of us met for the first time at the home of Kavi Schneider. Robert Larhoven set up a literature table with books and copies of Rethinking AIDS. Delegates who came up to the table were keenly interested in our ideas. The next day, Larhoven was expelled from the conference. Peter Schmidt and Christine Josvik, who were handing out leaflets, were violently attacked by several dozen members of ACT UP, who destroyed signs, burned leaflets, and attempted to destroy camera equipment. ACT UP members were staying in luxurious hotels with all expenses paid by welcome. Media people who witnessed these crimes reported nothing. The conference organizers took no action against the perpetrators. Following the, uh, this conference, an ACT on trial, chaired by Martin Walker, was held in London. In June 1993, the Perth Group's article, this is a Eleni Eliopoulos Valturner and John, um, oh dear, I can't pronounce the last name, I don't have it here, Papa Dimitriou, I think. Uh, the article is a Western blot proof of HIV infection argued that the HIV antibody tests had never been validated by isolation of the virus. Christine Johnson expanded upon the Perth Group's article, showing that dozens of conditions, flu vaccination, past malaria infection, drug abuse, etc., could cause positive readings. During 1993, the Sunday Times and Neville Hodgkinson were subjected to one vicious attack after another from AIDS activist medical people and Nature magazine. They responded with a page-wide page -wide banner, AIDS, why we won't be silenced. A number of AIDS dissonance books were published in 1993. Martin Walker's Dirty Medicine, Ian Young's The AIDS Dissidents, an annotated bibliography, and my own The AIDS War, Propaganda, Profiteering, and Genocide from the Medical Industrial Complex, and Robert Root Bernstein's Rethinking AIDS. Root Bernstein's book was unsatisfactory in many ways, and he is now on the other side. The fourth important Meditel documentary, AIDS in Africa, aired in 1993. In 1994, the rank of AIDS distance was joined by Kerry Mullis, who had just won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for inventing the polymerase chain reaction. On June 21, 1990,